Um, well, of course, I'm very pleased to be giving this talk at the EPS. The EPS and I go back a very long time. In fact, my first public talk was in a rather sunny Cambridge. Actually, I hadn't realised how much of my talk Celia was going to give in advance, but here's the first part of it. At that um, meeting, I remember, um, the August um, Henry Schaffer, a man I very much admired, took myself and a fellow, gra fellow graduate student for a drink at a pub by the river, and he advised us that what we should aspire to in our career is to produce one paper a year. Any less, and we weren't really trying, any more, and we weren't really thinking. Um, <laughs> if only that advice was still appropriate to people today, but it's not. Um, I think the founding of the EPS is more or less contemporaneous with the founding of information processing thinking about the mind and brain. Uh, in other words, we're thinking about this as a device that takes in information about the world, builds up a model of the world, and on the, use of, on the basis of that uses it to, to take decisions, to guide behaviour. Uh, and in the beginning of the society, it, I think those ideas were more or less equally interesting to people interested in human behaviour, such as Donald Broadbent, and people interested in neurophysiology, such as um, Barlow, for example. Uh, and for many years, certainly I, what I, one of the things I always used to like about EPS meetings was that um, coming together of traditions which were more to do with human cognition or more to do with uh, neuroscience and animal work, that you'd be going to the same meeting and at one moment it would be Henry Schaffer giving his talks on hierarchical motor control in the context of playing the piano and then the next one would be David Gaffin giving his always fascinating if rather um, iconoclastic views on how information, how acetylcholine got into the temporal lobe and this bearing on hippocampal amnesia, for example. And I think that continued throughout really, certainly up to the 90s, but I, I have a slight feeling that um, with the invention of neuroimaging and, and, and increasing popularity around about the turn of the century, a little bit before, there's a little, been a little bit of a siloization of people thinking that they're either cognitive psychologists or they're neuroscientists. Um, and debates at the EPS on whether or not, for example, imaging can ever be used to de de uh, decide between theories that have been based simply on our observations of behaviour and, and uh, cognitive theories of that sort. A good question, but in my opinion, one that more or less misses much of the point of why you'd want to do imaging experiments to, to look at how the brain is functioning. Uh, because it just seems like common sense so you shouldn't use the, phrase, the, word, the phrase common sense as, as acquired rather unfortunate associations recently. But it seems just common sense to think that if you're trying to understand how a complex machine operates, that it's a good idea to look at its output, as we do in cognitive psychology. But if you can, it's also a good idea to take a look inside and see what it's doing. And surely these two things are going to both have bearing on, on the conclusions that you draw. Anyway, that's certainly what I'm trying to illustrate in this talk, where I'll be as Celia has previewed, talking about um, human intelligence, first from the context of cognitive experiments and from imaging. And I think since we're already running horribly late, I'll probably um, just very quickly summarize the electrophysiological part oh, at the end. Um, so may, uh, actually, I should add one more apology. For people who've heard me talk in the last few years, you're going to hear much the same again. Um, but. I'll try and throw in a few new nuggets. But I've probably almost everybody in the room has seen this slide before because I've been using it for a very, very long time. And it illustrates the brain system that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I call it the multiple demand or MD system because I want to be relatively theory free and capture just the empirical definition of this system. What I'm showing you here is the joint pattern of activity that you see if you look at common a common brain response to many, many different kinds of cognitive challenge. So in this particular experiment, we looked at seven different rather unrelated challenges, and we're looking at the overlapping activity that's shown by increased challenge of all those different kinds. And this multiple demand or MD pattern has this very characteristic shapes in frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal cortex. In the lateral frontal cortex, you typically get in this sort of, we'll be seeing more detail later, but this sort of upside down Y pattern. Uh, in dorsomedial frontal cortex, it's always the pre-SMA and beginning to spill over into the dorsal part of the anterior cingulate, always accompanied by activity along the intraparietal sulcus. Uh, and usually, for many years, I've been ignoring this occipitotemporal component, believing it probably had to do with the fact that nearly all the tasks in these experiments were visual, uh, but I'm now sure that that's wrong. So we'll include this part as well in our, in our thinking. Um, 
whatever this is, the implication is that it must be something of very general importance in organizing behavior because it is by definition a brain system whose activity you see with increased demand of many different kinds. And here's the second bit of evidence that it's something important. If we take these standard tests of so-called fluid intelligence, novel problem solving, they derive their significance in psychology from the fact that performance on these tests is very widely predictive of success in all sorts of other activities in the world and in the laboratory, and um, simple problem solving tests. Uh, if you look at, use brain imaging to see what activity is typical of these compared with sensory motor controls, then depending on the power of your experiment, you'll get a picture that's really very similar to the, what you get by this independent means of overlapping activity from many different sorts of activity. So again, it suggests that this multiple demand or MD system is something of pretty widespread importance in controlling your behavior. And I'm going to begin uh, again with apologies to those who've heard this over the last few years with a very simple experiment putting forward my thinking about what it is that's critical in those fluid intelligence tests. Um, everybody thinks, of course, that the, these MD regions have something to do with cognitive control, but how should we conceive of what the core of cognitive control really is? Uh, and I think another way to ask the question is, what is it that's important about these, these um, fluid intelligence tests? There's been a huge amount of work in, in um, experimental psychology trying to work out, trying to relate performance in these fluid intelligence tests to simpler things that we think might be easier to analyze, such as um, reaction time is perhaps the most popular one. Various forms of working memory all, have also been looked at. And that's all very well, but the, fact, the psychometric fact that I'm not going to go into in great detail is that it's the very complexity of these tests is critical in when making them have this power of being fluid intelligence tests, which means that it, they predict behavior very broadly. So it's something to do with the fact that this test is a little bit more complicated than much of what we do in the laboratory that it gives them the property that is of interest. Um, and my suggestion is, as again, Celia, <laughs> it's great that I can get through my talk so fast, given that it went so far, it's been so much was introduced already, that the key thing when you're solving problems of this sort is to find a way to take this relatively complex whole and to focus attention on the simple parts within it, one after another, so that you end up knowing what the right answer is. For example, if you focus attention on shape, then it's perfectly obvious that the answer should be a circle. If you focus on color, it's obvious it should be black. If you focus on size, it's obvious it should be large. And if you put all these together, you know what the right answer is. Uh, and I think this intuitively corresponds reasonably to our idea of what um, more versus less intelligent performances are like, that, that intelligence is associated with this property of having a clear mind that right now for what you're doing, you're, you're, bear, you're keeping together the bits that do have a bearing and um, everything else is temporarily put on suspension. Um, but there's a second approach that in this experiment I'm going to tell you about is often thought about in, in the context of the complexity of these tasks, and that has to do with working memory load, and specifically with the idea that you've got these three separate sub-problems, if you like, to solve here, and you've got to solve each one, remember the answer for all of them, so you've got quite a bit to bear in mind, and then put them all together to decide that this is the right answer here. So the experiment we did was to modify these tasks in such a way as to try and eliminate that requirement to bear lots of things in mind and integrate them in producing a solution, but to maintain only the requirement to find the simple sub-problems sub to focus attention on one thing at a time. And yet we were predicting that people who, had, who struggled with standard fluid intelligence tests would continue to struggle with our simplified version. The way we did it was like this. Um, each, again, they were matrix problems. Uh, the objects in the matrix always had three different components to them. Um, you can probably see what the three components are here. And we had a response box at the bottom. And to, to offload this working memory load, we allowed people to draw their answer in as they, as they proceeded. So you might think that the person would focus attention on the right-hand side. Now it's perfectly obvious the answer should be curved, so they draw it in. Focus on the top, discover it should be solid, draw it in. Focus on the left, decide it should have a sharp angle, draw it in, and they're done. So now, because they could draw independently, and we could see from the timing of their responses that they did in fact draw independently, they can really, just, as long as they can find the simple problems, each part of it is completely trivial. And yet it was still true that people who performed, uh, actually they had half a minute just to um, solve each one of these, so we're plotting the proportion of them that are solved correctly, up the, top, up the y axis, and here is the score on a standard fluid intelligence test. We use something called the culture fair 
uh, and it's scored in terms of IQ from the from the population norm. So 100 means a person, of the, of the, the median person in the, in the reference population. And you can see that despite the fact that we, everything was, there was no real demand in this beside the demand of focusing on one thing at a time and finding out what the, the parts of the problem were, that still people with IQs below 100 on a standard fluid intelligence test were commonly really struggling, whereas people um, significantly above would get everything correct. Our plan was to, as I say, make this trivial, um, except for the component of focusing on one thing at a time. So we also did another version where we made that component of focusing on one thing at a time also very easy. So now what we've done is to take the exact same problem, but we've, four, we've, we've, we've divided it into parts for people. So now they focus on the left-hand one, they decide that it should be curved, they draw it in, focus on the middle one, decide it should be solid. Now it doesn't even seem like problem solving. You can see now that it's not got that combination of several, several simple parts. It just seems completely like the simplest physical decision task uh, and so on. So, and now, you can probably guess, everybody could do it pretty well. So indeed it confirms that the thing that's important about those complex fluid intelligence problem solving tasks is the fact that you have to find a way to focus on one part at a time, or, if you, or you might think of this as attending to one component of the problem at once. Um, I think that's important in these fluid intelligence tests and presumably accounts um, to a significant degree to their ability to have this broad positive correlation with all, sort, all manner of other activities. Um, as I've said, I think it implies that in problem solving, a key thing is to find the simple parts. But I would argue that this is really true in every single thing that we do, that for every bit of behavior that we are controlling, we've got to be putting together just the right bits for any given part of that activity and keeping everything else away. Um, and how, what, what, what might it take for a brain to be able to focus attention, for example, on one part of the problem? And uh, I can't understand why it's taken me 20 odd years to realize that the correct way of thinking about this, or at least for me, the correct way of thinking about it is really very close indeed to the way that I thought about visual attention back in the 1990s when this was still, um, still my main topic of research. So for visual attention, I put forward something that I call the integrated competition view back in the mid 1990s. Uh, and it was based on the following thoughts. First, any given object in the visual environment we know is processed in an in a expanding network of areas of cortex and subcortical regions, processing its different properties, features, affordances for actions, and so on. So the representation of any given object broadly distributed across much of the brain, really. Um, and yet, and we also know from behavioral experiments that when you attend to an object, when you pay attention to this, you essentially get all of its different properties for free. So somehow you've managed to get an integrated object out of this extremely distributed pattern of activity. We also know that you can start this process from any feature. You can say, pay attention to the thing that's right there in my hand, or you can say, pay attention to the pointer, or you can say, pay attention to the black things. And all of those different properties are going to be preferentially coded in different parts of this distributed representation. So you need some scheme in which you can start from anywhere in the representation, but you can end up getting the whole thing. And the ideas that we suggested in this integrated competition view were, well, you can make them up for yourself once I've put the problem in this way. First, the idea was that throughout the entire network, um, different object representations are competing with one another. So the more one gets stronger, uh, the more others fall away. Second, um, you can bias that competition in any one region by pre-activating, say, a given representation of a given position or a given shape or a different color. So that gives it a competitive advantage. It means it, gets advan it, it begins to take control of that part of the system. And third, you have to add some scheme for integration, meaning that as an object representation gains dominance in any one part of the network that supports its representation in every other part of the network, and the whole system has a tendency to cascade into a state where it's the same object that's dominating representations everywhere through the brain. And there were several things that I thought, I thought were interesting about this at the time. One is that um, it shows that for, for this system at least, you can't really have any sort of one-to-one -one mapping between components of 
a cognitive mechanism, for example, by selecting a given object for attending and particular brain regions. It's not like that. Um, selection, bias, competition and, and, and final resolution are all properties of the whole network rather than, rather than being separated to different parts of the network. To achieve this integration, which is the critical thing, I think it's been known very far, here's an early model by Faf van der Heiden and Hudson in 1990, that the likely thing you're going to need is neurons that are selective for conjunctions of properties. That's the, they're going to underlie the integration process. In this model, the idea was that suppose that you have, um, you've got a red object to the left and a, and a green object to the right, and you've been told pay attention to the red object. So how this works is that in the color module, there are two, two nodes, one for red and one for green, you pre-activate the red one. So in comes the red on the left and the green on the right. In this module, um, the red gets dominant, so the green is squelched. And now there's, so there's competition within modules and between the support between things that are congruent with one another. So the, uh, actually I've now forgotten which way around it was, but the red on the left will support the, the red, the red um, node in the color will support red on the left and red on the right in this conjunctions of color and, and, and um, location, which is what you've got down there. So now, again, the, the corresponding conjunction module gain, um, win, a node wins in this module, and it supports the um, corresponding then location in the location module with the result that if you say what's the, what's the location of the thing on the left, you can do it. So this is very straightforward and I think is, represents a more or less generic thought that if you're going to need a system for integrating what are in, in, in what parts of something that can all occur independently, you're going to need uh, neurons that are, that are selective for particular conjunctions. People often used to worry in this age about the, con the, the, um, the explosion of conjunctions if you had conjunctions for everything. But in the FAF scheme, you don't need conjunctions for everything. You just need all the pairs. So that's a much, much smaller and more manageable number. Now let's think about solving um, a, a, a fluid intelligence problem. So let's think what it would mean to, for example, attend to the top part here when we're going to decide that the answer should, should be solid. Well, there's an awful lot of stuff that you're going to have to integrate, even in that very simple, um, simple um, fragment of cognition, if you like. Um, very much reminiscent of the con general concept in, in computing a variable binding that, you've, that for much of this you're going to have to tie components of what you see and are thinking to their particular roles in the information structure that you're trying to create. Um, so obviously you're going to have to bind the shapes to the colors as we've been talking about for the object. We're going to have to bind each of these shapes and color combinations to their positions in the matrix. We're going to have to bind all that to the task rules that are implicitly telling you you want something here that makes looks as if it's a good pattern. Um, we're going to have to bind all this to the reward structure, which means that you're doing this in order to please the experimenter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, we now have to think of a scheme where an awful lot of stuff, of fragments, can be put together in exactly the right roles and relations with one another. Um, and I would imagine that this takes the form, as I imagine it does in the visual case, of the tops of these figures and all their implications for the, in the context of this particular problem are dominating throughout a highly extended brain ne network dealing with all these different features that are relevant to any, any little bit of cognition. Now, if that's going to happen, what, how could the brain produce it? And what I'm going to do in the next part of the talk is to, is to present some um, new, um, I hope new to you, most of you, imaging findings on uh, so our original interest was on the anatomy and, and more, a more precise anatomy and functional analysis of the MD system. But I think uh, eventually the picture that we build up has fairly transparent bearing on this question of integration of, of whole brain function. So we began, um, here's, here's what was state-of-the-art MD system um, from a paper published um, seven, seven years ago now by uh, Fedorenko and Nancy Kamisher and me, where, as I say, we took fairly standard brain imaging analysis pipeline, applied it to seven different tasks, and looked for the conjunction of activity across all those tasks. And recently, with the publication of this Glasser et al. paper from the Human Connectome Project group, um, there's been improved methods for, uh, for, well, I'll talk about this a bit more later, for analyzing brain imaging data and for combining across multiple imaging modalities 
to hopefully very much increase the precision of what you can learn from brain imaging experiments. So as probably you, uh, many of you all know, the proposal now from this Glasser et al paper is that each um, hemisphere of the, of the human cerebral cortex is divided into 180 separate areas. Uh, their basic method is to use multiple imaging modalities, for example, resting state connectivity, myelin content, gray matter um, thickness, and they look across the surface of the cortex and where there's an edge, where there's a change in multiple modalities, they draw the boundary of an area and then have tried to relate the resulting areas to what's known largely from macaque experiments. Um, so we've got this new, new vision, if you like, of the, of the human brain divided into 180 separate chunks. Uh, and we thought, wouldn't it be interesting then to ask which of these much more specifically defined chunks have this multiple demand or MD property? And to do this, we collaborated with, the, with Glasser and Van Essen from the HCP team um, and looked at their own human, computer, uh, um, human connectome project data uh, because in addition to all these modalities for defining individually these regions in each person's, in each person's brain, they have a number of um, functional activation um, experiments, if you like. And we identified three that we knew should be ones that would produce the usual ND activity pattern and again look for the conjunction between them. These aren't the greatest that I would have chosen uh, later on. I'll briefly tell you what we're doing with this now. Um, but this was the three that was available because this, the, the, the data were not designed for this purpose. The first is a classic uh, working memory n back task, so sequence of pictures. Person's either doing two back matching or just looking for a fixed target, which is often called naught back. Uh, the second one was a relational reasoning task um, in the easy version. So we're going to look at hard minus easy from this working memory. Same hard minus easy and relational reasoning. In the simpler version, you simply had to decide whether or not um, either one at the top matched some target on a given feature. And in the more complex one, you had to decide about the relationship between these two, in this case, different in shape, same in texture, and decide whether that relationship was true down here. The third one, um, people always roll their eyes a little bit at this, but it was what we had, and we didn't think two was enough. So we decided to use a, um, a contrast that is in the HCP database between solving arithmetic problems and um, story comprehension. Uh, and just believe me that, ever, that arithmetic, there's lots of data, is a very strong MD system driver where story comprehension isn't. So we thought this contrast would work as well. And it's also interesting, going back to what I was saying earlier, that these, in this task it was auditory. And, uh, but still, what we did is compare um, arithmetic minus story, hard minus easy relational reasoning, hard minus easy working memory, uh, and look for, now in each individual person, we've identified all 360 across the two hemispheres, cortical areas, and we're asking which of those um, across a whole group of about 449 people are significantly more, have a conjunction of greater activity for each of these three contrasts. And the result is very much like what we knew before, but it really does look kind of um, more and more, more and more specific and exactly defined. Uh, one way to think about, to look at that is down here on the flat map of the brain. So this is one cerebral hemisphere that's been flattened out. And you can see nine very, very specific patches that have this MD property broadly distributed across frontal, parietal, occipital lobe. And so it's, it's easier to orient if we look up here. In the frontal lobe, it's not really, you know, tons of the, of the frontal lobe by any stretch of the imagination. On the lateral frontal surface, three very specific patches spread out along, along um, the bottom of the middle frontal gyrus, probably. This just anterior to the uh, frontal eye field, we've been wondering for years what this really frontal eye field, but you see now it's another area which um, is called I68, for those of you who care, that's immediately anterior to the frontal eye field. In the insula, we now see that the peak is, is indeed, we've never been quite sure whether it was in the insula or the adjacent frontal operculum, and it spreads over the two, but the peak is right in the anterior part of the insula. Along the intraparietal sulcus, it's right in the depths this, the, here. The, the brain is puffed out so that everything is shown on the surface, but this is the depth of the intraparietal sulcus and immediately to either side. Another thing we've been uncertain about for many years is whether this spilled over into the, onto the medial surface. And if you look down here, you see a very specific MD region that's, um, that corresponds here that's separated by, from the intraparietal sulcus area by the, the crown of the brain, if you like. 
Uh, and again, this occipitotemporal region, it's slightly more anterior here than usually it is, and in, then more anterior than it is in our subsequent experiments with similar methods. Um, but it is important, it's interesting that this is not now, we know it's nothing to do with this being a byproduct of higher visual processing because one of these tasks is auditory. So this seems like another general MD region here. Uh, so the first point to make about this is that these are very specific, very tightly defined, but very broadly distributed throughout, um, throughout the higher, higher regions, if you like, higher processing regions of the cortex. I forgot to mention the, um, this was um, it's now got a different naming from the pre-SMA, but anyway, the corresponding region in the dorsomedial frontal surface. Um, that was just... Um, that was an analysis really showing the overlap here. We've done it a different way by taking each individual region and saying um, which of them, as I said, are significantly positive in all three of the contrasts. And now you get this um, complete list of the individual cortical regions that have this MD property. And one thing that um, you'll see in a minute is quite interesting to do is if we look across this set of 27 um, MD regions and ask for which, which are the strongest uh, activity uh, in other words, which are stronger than the average of, of all 27, then you get, end up with something that we are now calling the MD core. The yellow ones are stronger than the average on all th three contrasts, the orange ones in two out of three contrasts. Um, and you now um, see, for example, again, this I68 region in dorsal, dorsal, very dorsal part of posterior frontal cortex. Um, Marcel's beloved IFJ re region here spreading forward to um, two separated parts of 946 insula uh, along the intraparietal sulcus and this dorsomedial parietal as well, uh, dorsomedial frontal as well. Um, now that we have these regions so well defined, I think we can do things that we have never been able to do before. Um, for example, there are dozens to hundreds of papers in the literature looking at MD-like regions, but of course, in the usual brain imaging, you don't really know whether it's these, these exact regions or not, and suggesting, making suggestions about specialization of function of various kinds. Those of you who read this literature will have read a lot of this. And any given paper is, looks robust, but there's no consensus. There's no picture is built up in my mind of what the specializations are of different parts of this network. And as soon as you see what it's like if you're looking at this level of precision, you can see why that's going to be. It's always going to be a disaster. Suppose if your report, if two, if four, well, no, not two, suppose 100 papers are all reporting something about dorsolateral frontal cortex. Well, there's an awful lot of quite different things. There are regions, there are MD regions immediately next to regions that have completely the opposite activity that are going down in all the more demanding, um, in all the demanding conditions compared with the, um, compared with less demanding. And certainly, um, if, if there's that level of resolution in your data, you're never going to be able to look properly at whether or not these regions are, have differences between one another. But in our data, especially with 449 subjects, we can look at that. And when you do, you can also see why it's been so difficult to make progress on this. So what we have done here is to uh, put, map out our 27 MD regions. And we have shown there, this is just the beta level of, uh, uh, for contrast between, uh, between the two versions, for maths and story in blue, working memory in orange, relational reasoning in green. And two things hit you in the eye. First, the system behaves as a whole. So for almost every region, it's true that maths has got the strongest activity, working memory the next, and relational reasoning the next. I'm sure that's arbitrary in terms of the content. You know, you could change the, the difficulty of any of these and change the ordering of that, but it tends to show that the whole system behaves consistently. Point one. Point two, now these data are so beautiful, you can believe that every single little wrinkle you see on these graphs is real. How do I know that? Um, well, here we've got two independent groups of 210 people and we've plotted those profiles for the two groups. You can't see there are two groups. These data are essentially perfect by the time you've got 200 and odd people. So that means that it's true that the system as a whole tends to be most driven by arithmetic here and least driven by relational reasoning. But the exact profiles of activity across all 27 regions are not the same. So yes, it's cup half full and half empty. There's specialization, but it's in the context of an overall behavior as a whole. 
Um, and of course, every, every little detail of specialization here of, of slightly differential behavior when one of these graphs is shaped differently from one of these graphs is probably not something you're going to want to leap into an exact cognitive interpretation of. There's just too much and it's unlikely to believe, it's, it's hard to persuade yourself that this is the way to work towards understanding. Um, so that's the set. first point was wide distribution, the second point was relative functional preferences in the context of overall network behavior, and the third point um, has to do with connectivity. So what, also in the HCP um, database, there, there are resting state scans and the standard analysis of connectivity, which means correlation across time. And now what we've done is to take the 27 MD regions in this bottom set we've put the core and then the, rem the remainder which uh, sorry I didn't mention we've been calling the penumbra uh, and the, the brightness of the color shows the strength of resting state connectivity and you can see it's strongest in the core uh, it's next for core to penumbra and it's least for the penumbra regions one, um, for, with one another um, repeated down here so this is core to other core and this is core to penumbra this is core to remaining the remaining non-MD regions in the brain, which is essentially zero, it's a, you know, uh, on, on the average, to a mixture of, of positive and negative. Uh, penumbra to penumbra, so, somewhat higher than penumbra to non-MD. Um, again, not penumbra to non-MD regions close to zero, and never mind about the last bit, that's not particularly interesting. Um, another way to show the same thing, a recent paper um, from the Cole Group, G. et al., used these same data uh, to, to do the usual analysis of resting state data to create canonical connectivity networks, as they're often thought of. Networks of strongly connected regions. Um, and here, are, what we find is that our MD regions fall into four of the G et al networks. The core regions are all in their so-called frontoparietal control network. Um, as you would think, we already proved they were strongly connected to one another, and that shows up in this solution. Whereas the penumbra are distributed along ar around um, some in the front of parietal control network, but some more connected to, more into other networks, implying they've got connectivity to a wider set of regions in the brain. So now I think you can see where I'm going with this. We decided we were thinking we want a network that uh, a system that's capable of putting together almost any fragments of brain activity to produce a cognitive entity that will correspond to focused attention on a single, single moment of, of thinking, such as solving the upper part of the matrix problem. Uh, and here we've got a, a network that A, widely distributed through the brain. Most connectivity in the brain is local, so this means we have a network that's got connectivity, I would say, to almost anything. Second, strong connectivity between one part of it and another, which means, presumably, strong ability to communicate and to pass information from one part to another. So this is why um, I suspect in fMRI it's hard or impossible to find really good separations between these different components of the MD network, simply because they're exchanging information so fully and far, far faster than we're measuring in fMRI, so you're never going to see any great difference between them in, with, the, with this method. Um, and what about the relative functional preferences? Uh, well, again, I think this now follows, follows logically what you would make of this, that because these regions are in different um, parts of the brain, strongest connection to different other systems, uh, the connectivity of the insula, for example, is nothing at all like the connectivity of the intraparietal sulcus. So that means that each part of this network has probably got preferential access to different kinds of information in the first instance. But as I say, they can probably widely exchange and integrate. So I think that probably provides a sensible basis for this tendency all to respond together to a degree, to the extent that the whole network is having to work hard to create this cognitive fragment, but with quantitative specializations for one thing or another, depending on what the exact contents of the particular cognitive fragment that you're putting together right now happen to be. Right, I knew after that charming but lengthy introduction that I wasn't going to have time to finish my talk, um, so I'm going to just tell you the last bit more at the bullet point level. Uh, uh, and this is the part that, has, that is um, neurophysiology. So I like it very much, but I don't have time to... to um, oh! Missed something, and I'm, I, I like this even more, so I'm going to tell you this. Um, the HCP methods 
um, I've become a massive groupie for these. I now think that this is the way that brain imaging will be done in the future. I think, it's a, it, I think it's, it, it, it brings the new dawn. Um, and here is one of the reason why I think that. Uh, recently, not using their data, we've begun to, to do projects in Cambridge where we're using their, uh, an their, their, their um, scanning procedures and analysis pipeline on new data. Uh, and especially their way of normalizing on the surface instead of the way that we have always done it in SPM and other packages gives the most spectacular results. So here are two sets of data which come from the same group of about 40 subjects, one doing a visual end back task and one doing an auditory end back task. I don't know why you're not gasping. You know, this is just <laughs> ridiculous. I told my student, Murtaz Assem, three times to go back and make sure that he hadn't somehow put the same data in both figures. So if you scrutinize, you can find differences, but it's just ridiculously the same. Um, so that means that everything you see here, you can take to be real, I think. With this, and we've never been in that position with brain imaging before. Um, I like to wind people up by saying, Remember the bad old days when we used to worry about the reproducibility crisis? I don't think so. Um, and I think by far, of course, the best solution to reproducibility crises is not legislation, though it has its place. The best play solution is great data, and then you don't have to worry anymore. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not going to have time to tell you about or, so this wasn't just an experiment on working memory, it was an experiment on other aspects of executive control, such as inhibition and um, task switching, and probably more, we'll add. Uh, and in each case, as you probably imagine from what I've told you before, the picture looks very like this, but also not the same. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not identical, but it's two working memory tasks that really is identical. So it tells you the similarity is interesting, but the differences uh, may be small and quantitative, but they're real as well. Okay, so as for the neurophysiology, I just wanted to uh, basically make a point that's very well made in the literature already, so it doesn't really matter that I don't have time to. Uh, it's the point that I've already um, alluded to in, what, in, in talking about the binding together, the integrating of parts, fragments of a cognitive activity into exactly the right roles and relations into the right processing structure that you need to do a particular thing right now. And going back to the matrix, uh, you might think of, for example, you, know, you, might, you look at the difference between the item on the top left and the top right, uh, and that difference has got to be perceived and bound to exactly what its role is in this particular problem that you're thinking about right now. And as I say, very much like variable binding. Um, and it's very reminiscent of, of something that's become very cool in the frontal lobe neurophysiology literature over the last few years, though I think personally it goes back to the original insights of parallel distributed processing. It's now called nonlinear mixed selectivity, but basically it means conjunction coding. That is, neur neurons being selective, not so much for the abstract features of a problem, but for the combinations, the conjunctions of features that, are, uh, that you also need in order to get things bound in the right way. Uh, and I was going to show you data, but I'm not going to anymore, from monkeys carrying out a task in which they have to um, identify in a set of objects which ones are targets for a current problem. Uh, and we looked at two different parts of this, of, of this, um, of the, of the task, or of the, each trial actually. A feedback part, where they reach out and touch an object. A feedback part, where they're told whether it's right or wrong, so at that point, they should be, if it's right, storing it into working memory so that they'll come back and select it again on the next trial. And a choice part where they're looking at an array and deciding to reach out and touch one of the objects. Um, I wouldn't try and look at the slide because I'm not going to explain it properly. But the essential finding is in very much in line with what I've just been saying, that if you look at the pattern of activity across either a population of lateral frontal or a population of inferior parietal neurons for the feedback phase, where the cognitive operations are putting things into working memory, or the choice phase where they're retrieval and selection in an object display. Very, very strong and stable patterns of activity across the population for those two types of cognitive operation, completely orthogonal and independent of one another, implying that to set up these two different stages of the task, you use two really independent patterns of activity in these control regions. Not only is there independence in the overall activity pattern, 
but there's independence in the object coding. So if you look in feedback, you'll find neurons that are selective for one object rather than another. And if you look at choice, you'll find neurons that are selective for one object versus another. But those two preferences are completely independent of one another. Um, which goes mean is as much as to say that you have neurons, perhaps I'll just show you a couple of neurons that are selective for conjunctions of role and content for variable binding, if you like. So here's a neuron in the front, uh, these are both from frontal cortex actually. Um, so it's activity in spikes per second for the four different objects that uh, he might be choosing. For trials when he chooses objects one, two, three, and four, this is in the feedback phase, this is in the choice phase. This neuron's only active during feedback. Um, it's not characteristically true, as I say, that there's this pattern, the activity in these two stages is completely independent of one another. But this one happens to be only active in the feedback phase, and it's object selective in the feedback phase, no, not object selective at all in the choice phase. And here's one that's sort of the other way around. So both of those, you can see, are nonlinear mixed selectivity neurons or conjunction neurons there, where they integrate content, um, cont or if you like, um, function and argument, you might, you might say. Good. I wanted to save time for questions. I have saved time for questions. Um, so here are, here are, here are the, my overall conclusions. Fluid intelligence, so that cognitive experiment, trying to argue that the key component of it is attending to focus steps one after the other uh, and binding together the many components to make up even one simple step of, of behavior in a problem of that sort. Um, the MD system, I think, having the anatomy and properties that you need for, some th for a system whose role is indeed to bind together any cognitive content according to the particular task that you're car currently carrying out. Um, and this part we rushed over, but um, as I say, anybody who reads the frontal lobe literature at the moment knows that there are tons and tons of papers on this conjunctive coding or mixed selectivity property. Uh, and now I want to thank my collaborators. Fluid intelligence study was done by a magnificently successful summer student, Daphne Chalinski and Danny Mitchell. My, I call him my <coughs> postdoc, but actually he's, he, he's the one who makes sure everything is actually good, whereas I just watch and say, oh, good. Uh, and another student, um, Apurva Bandari. The parcelated MD system, my current student, Murtaz Assem, who I think has, uh, has, has been a massive success in, in, in getting the HCP uh, the collaboration going with the HCP group and uh, implementing all, the, uh, learning and implementing all that you need to use their processing pipeline. Can't recommend this too strongly for those of you ever thinking about doing an fMRI experiment again. And the electrophysiology that I just rushed over in the Oxford lab, Miki Kadahisa, Kei Watanabe and Makoto Kusunoki, and my long-term collaborator again, Mark Buckley. And I am finished and ready for questions. Thank you very much.